Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 4. We're going to look at that here just as we get started. Uh, but I want to preach the last message in our family month a series of messages. And I want to ask you this question. This is going to be the sermon title. What does your family really need? What does your family really need? A lot of people talk about, and we could fill in the blank, health, help. Oh, was it help? Help. help. Okay, my family needs help. Okay, uh, all right, that, that, could, that could be, all right. But, um, you know, you could fill that blank in with a lot of different things. People think, you know, bigger house, bigger car, more stuff, more this, more whatever it is. Um, and sometimes we, we get so focused on more stuff to make our family happy. We think that maybe the kids need to be more involved in athletics or, you know, because it's never school generally, right? It's never, we need our children to, to, um, to have more education or maybe more tutoring or that kind of thing generally it's kind of more activities we want them signed up for you know ball and different stuff and different activities in the glee club and the chess club and 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 all of those kind of things and and what that brings into our lives is okay you got to get get them to all of those things right and that causes problems maybe it is again more money i can remember one time, my dad come walking out of the down the down the hallway in my parents' house. They had uh, hardwood floors everywhere except the living room and the kitchen area and the utility room. And you could tell down the hall he came, very distinct sound. And he had a suitcase in one hand and some hanging clothes in the other. And my mom and brother and sister were sitting there in the living room, the family room we called it. And because we had another room on the other side of the wall that nobody sat in called the living room. We never lived in it. We just that that was just where it was. Anyway, we were all looking at him. And I asked, I said, where are you going? He said, well, I got to be in North Carolina in the morning. I said, really? Because I thought he had a job, you know, in the local area you know, right close by, it just took him 20 minutes or so from the house to get to work every day. And I said, when did this happen? He said, several weeks, however long ago it was and that kind of thing. And, and I said, well, why are you going to North Carolina? He said, well, I'm doing it for my family. And as much as I love my father, he was wrong. He thought that we needed the family more money. Now, more money is a good thing, right? I'd rather have a little bit more than not enough, right? Right? Okay. Um, I, I, I realize that, that, that money does, can't buy happiness. I understand that, but it, it will help you. Okay? Uh, but I also know that the love of money is the root of all evil. So you have to balance that, okay? But sometimes we think that, well, my family really needs this. And then when we go after it, what happens is we find out, we get disappointed because what my family really needed in that regard, as far as my, my family, my personal relationship with my father was concerned, I didn't necessarily need more money. I needed more time with him. And we had a special that talked about those family members. God's going to want them back. And that's the case. And, and it's the, the really some things that we need to consider as we talk about this morning and look at what the Bible has to say. I want to encourage you to seriously think about what we're going to look at because as we finish up family month, uh, it's important for us. I want to read Psalm 4, you're already there, and verse number 5. 
verse number five. We're going to get look at this verse, and then we're going to use it as a springboard into the message, which I have entitled, What Does Your Family Really Need? Psalm 4 and verse 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together. We ask your blessings on the families that make up Harborside Baptist Church, whether they're um, represented here in person or online. And we thank you for both of those groups, Lord. We thank you for the capability that we have of staying connected uh, with our, our, our church family. We thank you for the fact that you are our Father, and because you own the cattle on thousand hills, we that relationship with you, as the little song says, uh, they're mine as well. And we thank you for that. We thank you for our family. We thank you for providing for us and watching over us and, and bringing us together uh, here in this location. And, and Father, we pray that as we look into your word, that we would focus our attention upon what our family really needs, according from to your your perspective. We all have an idea of what would be best for our family, but undoubtedly you are the only one that truly knows what is best for our family because you see all of that. You know what is the outcome of every decision we make in order to take care of the needs of our families. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to examine our, our lives and, and how we're providing for our family and seriously consider adjusting our thinking to what your word says. We pray for the children that their time would be profitable. We pray for ourselves that you would remove any of the distractions that come our way and help us to focus our attention upon your word. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this particular verse in Psalm 4, verse number 5, speaks of offering, as it says there, the sacrifices of righteousness. Well, let me just break this down here because there are three key words in this verse. The first one is uh, the first word in the verse, Psalm 4, 5, begins with the word offer, okay? Offer. Are you aware of the fact that God will never force you to live righteously? God will never do that. He never forces people into trusting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He will never force you into a salvation decision. I know there are some, you know, maybe some religions, even under the guise of Christianity, that kind of do that. I remember years ago, we took a, a group of teenagers to a, an area-wide youth meeting. They had preaching, and then we had some activities and some refreshments and snacks and so on, and, and then some more preaching. And as the afternoon was winding down, the main speaker was preaching, and he preached a good message to teenagers and so on. And then when he gave the invitation, he just simply asked that any of those, one, if you've never been saved, you know, would you indicate by lifted hand, you've heard me say some similar kind of things. We all know what an invitation is, and nobody moved. And then he did it again, and then he did it again, and then he did it again, and then when he finally figured out that nobody was coming forward for salvation, he started working on the, sal the saved teens in a matter of speaking, and his last appeal, after about 20 minutes of an invitation, was... If you're breathing, there, you have something wrong between you and God, and you need to get right, and you need to come forward. So how many of us are breathing? All of us. And what happened? The altar was flooded because everybody came down, okay? And then at the conclusion of that meeting... I heard some of the uh, pastors talking and this particular uh, f uh, 
speaker, special speaker, and so on. And he said, boy, he said, so many decisions made at this meeting. It was really great. But what were they? Were they really genuine decisions? The answer to the question is no. But there are people like that. They'll f try and force you into, you know, how many of you have ever um, gone, you know, you get those little, little announcements or cards in the, in the mail, you know, to come to this particular place to look at a timeshare, you know, and they, they, they give you the, you know, the free meal and the free gift and the, you know, just come, no strings attached, right? Yeah, right. Sure there are. And I've heard of people that go because, you know, whatever they're giving away is kind of nice. They give, you know, whatever it is, toaster or coffee maker or something, you know, whatever, just come look at our thing and, and hear the presentation and you don't have to buy anything. You can leave right after you're done, but they will try to force you. You know, if you've ever been through that, just sign on the dotted line, sign right here. You come, you go there and you say, no, the only reason I came was to get my toaster or whatever it was, or get a meal at this particular place and look at those. And, and, and they, they try to force you into those things understand this, God will never do that. He says, offer there. And what does that mean? Well, just what it says. You need to offer the Lord. And there's a word there that also mentions sacrifice. He says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. The only truly godly example that we can give is a sacrifice. Okay. Paul said, to the Romans in chapter 12 of that letter, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? Sacrifice your bodies. What does that mean? You have to offer that. You have to offer the Lord your life. That's what that word bodies means. He's not talking about literally physically dying every day, okay? But Righteousness is the only truly godly example that we can give to, to people and to the Lord. God's only, he's not going to be um, satisfied with anything else, okay? And he goes on and he talks about righteous, righteousness there. Um, and all of those things work together, okay? You have to offer it. You have to sacrifice it. And it is a sacrifice to live a godly life, okay? And what kind of things will you sacrifice to do that? You're going to sacrifice a lot of, of different areas of your life. Um, you're going to sacrifice, you, you know, the world is saying, hey, you really need this. If you're going to be happy, you know, you're going to need this. There's a song, you're familiar with it. It says something about the best part of waking up. Okay, now you've probably got that in your head, right? The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup, okay? Um, I appreciate you throwing that in there. You're right. Um, I've had Folgers, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the man that married my wife and I, uh, he's with the Lord now as far as I know, uh, Dr. Richard Folger. Uh, his wife came to our church when we were up in Monroe County at my wife's our invitation to speak at a ladies gathering. And I was talking to her and uh, I had Arbuckle's coffee in my home. And uh, I asked her, I said, uh, now, Mrs. Folger, I said, have you ever tried Arbuckle's coffee? And she very meekly, lovingly smiled at me. And she said, Brother Arbuckle, why would I drink Arbuckles when I can drink Folgers? And I said, okay, never mind. You know, and I went and sat down in the corner somewhere, right? But what's the best part of waking up? Folgers in your cup, okay? What's the best part? What's the best thing you can do for your family? That's what we're talking about. Um, the best thing that you're family or you can do for your family is to give them your example your example of a righteous relationship with the lord 
to offer that sacrifice to the Lord. Too often that's not the case in homes. I want you to turn to Psalm 101 real quickly. Psalm 101. Psalm 101.1 says, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. What does that sound like? What, is, what, what, what topic is David referring to here? What do we sing a lot of? What gets stuck in your head sometimes is music, right? What kind of music do you have in your home? What kind of music do you listen to? Psalm 101, 2 says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. He says there again in verse number two, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way and walk within my house with a perfect heart. What does that mean? What does that sound like? That sounds like the person in the ex ex exhortation here from David is that we need to be aware of how we act in our home, right? Doesn't it sound that way? Too often what we do, though, uh, is we will say things to our family that we would never say to anybody else, right? Right? We treat our family the way we would never treat other people outside our home. That's just the dynamic of family living. We think we can get away with it. It's our family, right? They won't care, okay? Well, yeah, uh, they will care, and you should care because God cares, and if it's whatever's coming out of your mouth or whatever's coming out in your life and so on, if it's not wise living, if it's not perfect living, it is from a biblical standpoint, proper living, okay, what is it? It's going to damage your family. It's, it's, it, and maybe even for generations, it's going to damage your family. So what does your family need? Well, your family, again, needs your example. What are they learning from you? I remember watching a commercial years ago, and I think it might have been when Ronald Reagan was the president back in the 80s, uh, Mrs. Reagan uh, started this program. You remember the uh, Just Say No to Drugs? You remember that? Just Say No. Uh, and um, this commercial came on, this little boy, this boy, he was in maybe junior high, uh, seventh, eighth grade, something like that. He was sitting on his bed, and um, his father came in, and his father, you could tell when the doors flung open and his father stepped into the room, you could tell he was not happy. And his father had this box of stuff and he asks the boy, he says, where did you get this? You tell me right now. And the boy is trying to claw, he's clawing his way up the wall, basically trying to get away from his dad. And it's because his dad is so very, very angry. Where did you get this stuff? Tell me who got it for you. Who, how'd you buy it? And what'd you do this, this, and the other? And he was just going on and 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 on. And the boy says, I got it from you. I learned it from you. And the dad was slapped right in the face with the reality of the fact that not only did he have a drug problem, but his, he taught his son the same thing. Question, what are you teaching your family? Because they watch you and they're, you know, they're, they're smarter than we give them credit for, right? And they pick things up faster than we realize. So what are you teaching? What is the example that you are giving to your family? Because they need that but you've got to be careful 
that it's the kind of relationship that will be pleasing to the Lord. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 18. I want you to notice an example of this. 1 Samuel, back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel, verse 18, because we saw what David is talking about, walking within his home in a perfect way with a perfect heart and offering the sacrifice of righteousness and so on. I want you to notice David's example here, the kind of character that David had even as a young man in 1 Samuel 8, 18, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 14. Notice what it says here. Well, let's start at verse number 12, because that's where the thought really starts, okay? It says, and Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, speaking of David, and was departed from Saul. Now, why was the Lord with David and not Saul? Well, one of the reasons being is because Saul disobeyed the Lord, okay? You will get in trouble really, really fast. I don't care how old you are, what your position is, or anything about you, but it, you will get in trouble really, really fast if you just decide it's the best thing for me if and my family if I disobey the Lord. And you can justify it. You can come up with all kinds of reasons. And, of course, the, uh, the world is going to say, yeah, exactly. What difference does it make? go for it. If it feels good, do it. Okay. But Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and had departed from Saul. It says, therefore, Saul removed him from him, made him his captain over a thousand and went out and, and he went out and came in before the, the people. Now what, because of David's character, Saul saw that. And what did he do? He put him over a group of soldiers and so on. David was a man of war, after all, even as a young man. But notice verse 14, it says, And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and, and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. What did he do? He was leading the army and so on. What am I getting at? I'm getting at this. David's example, even as a young man, was seen. There was a man named Saul who didn't like it, okay? You start living godly for the Lord and righteously for the Lord, and you start sacrificing and offering up that kind of life as an example to your family, an example to others that you come in contact with, and there's a possibility they're not going to like that. Yeah, I, I remember a couple that we came in contact with up in Monroe County years ago. The gentleman had a, a very good job, and he would, but he was... Uh, as an engineer, he had to travel quite a bit, was gone quite a bit, and uh, his wife was home with their two teenagers, and we brought the teenagers down uh, from our church up in Monroe County to a church here in Marietta, and during the activities and so on, and the, um, one of the, the Christian gospel-related movies that was out at that time, both of the teenagers got saved which, you know, we're driving home and we're like, Whoo man, that is great. So they come to church the following Sunday. Well, it was a Saturday when the kids got saved. They come to church on Sunday and guess who walked the aisle to get saved? Their mom. She got saved. The two kids got saved. The husband was away doing his job. And when he came home, he had a new family. They started coming to church. They started reading their Bibles. They started, you know, being careful about what they said and what they did and, and, and so on and so forth. And he is an unsaved man, didn't know how to handle it. Long story short, sadly, he left them. But be prepared. You start living the kind of life you ought to live and that your family needs to see and you might get some pushback, but don't give up. Keep, keep going. Keep living that life. Because David, it says, 
the people love David, right? There are going to come people that, yeah, if you start living for the Lord, if you start at your workplace and people curse and cuss and all this other stuff, and you go, hey, look, I don't, I don't want to hear that kind of talk around me. I've come in contact with some folks in our area, some men that I, I consider friends or at least really good acquaintances that, you know, that I understand they're as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. Why wouldn't they talk in a filthy manner? But they also know that when I step into their presence, I'm a pastor. And a couple of the men that I'm thinking of right now, they work together and I was happened to be at their, uh, their, their place of business. And, and the one guy was going on, they were picking at one another because one was in the, you know, one branch and the other was in another branch. So there was that uh, inner branch, inner military rivalry going on and so on. And, and uh, the one guy says, Hey, look, you shouldn't be lying. Lying is a sin. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to that and I'm going, okay, I wonder if I was not here, would they be talking about sin and different things like that? And, and the other guy who was accused of lying says, oh no, he said, you bring a stack of Bibles this high and I'll put my hand on them and I'll swear I'm telling the truth. And he said, better yet. And he reached across the counter and grabbed me. And he says, we got a preacher right here. And he said, I'll put my hands on him. And I was kind of gone, how are you going to, well, okay, wait a minute. What is that? Just exactly what does that mean? Put your hands on me, you know? And because this guy was a combat veteran. And I'm going, I don't know if I want you to put your hands on me or not, you know? And I said, so what you're telling me is that I'm, I'm, my, my value to you is at least the same value as a stack of Bibles this high, right? And he's going, well, yeah, I'm telling you. And he's telling his friend, he said, look, see, I got this guy. And I'm going, I was like, I'm, I'm telling you the truth, man. And you can verify it, right? Don, you can verify it, right? Ha, ha, ha. I'm going, yeah, I suppose. Okay. Some people, when they start living differently, you will make the kind of impact you're hoping to make because some of these guys, they, they curse when I'm not in their presence, but when I show up, they may still curse, but they'll go, sorry about that. Excuse my French. Why is it always French? I don't know. Okay. Uh, but you, you understand what I'm getting at. I hope is the impact that you will make in living the kind of sacrificial offering of a righteous life is going to make an impact. And your family needs that. Your family needs your example. Now, the question is, because they're going to get it. They're going to get an example one way or the other. And there are only two options. It's either going to be a good example or it's going to be a bad example right? Well, let's go a little further. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Clear over in the New Testament to 1 Thessalonians, past Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, to 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse number seven, Paul is talking about his introduction into the, to the Thessalonians uh, and the, the people of Thessalonica. He spent about three weeks there, planted a church, and had to leave, okay? But the Thessalonian Christians, the church in Thessalonica is a good testimony of the fact that um, they kept going for the Lord. Look at verse number seven. First Thessalonians 2, 7 says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear to us. What's the second point of the message? The second point of the message is, 
as we answer the question, what does your family need? Firstly, they need your example, right? Godly, perfect, righteous example. Your family also needs, in addition to that, as he says here in verse number seven, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Now, let me just mention something to you from the Greek standpoint, okay? The word nurse, when you think of the word nurse, what do you think of? Maybe you think of my wife. Maybe you think of I think of my, my wife and I think of my mom. I think of the ladies that you, you know I have seen in the past who were in white uniforms and the little funny looking white hats and, and the, the white hose and the white funny looking shoes and maybe a little pin on them or something. You, we've all been there, done that, seen them and that kind of thing. Now they wear scrubs and you can't tell which one's which, okay? Uh, so forth. So um, this particular word, however, is not referring to somebody that is a, uh, a medical professional, okay? It's not talking about somebody that has gone to school, got a bachelor's degree in the science of nursing. That's not what this is, okay? This particular word in the Greek language refers to a nursing mother, okay? A nursing mother. Those of you that are in that category and have ever seen that, you know how carefully and lovingly a nursing mother cares for her children, right? That's the idea that Paul is referring to. And what it means is that we should be the one who calms, because, you know, kids come home and sometimes they're like, they get off the bus and they come running into the house and they throw their book bag across the living room and they are in, I mean, it is, it terror just came to dwell in your home, right? And you go, whoa, 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 hang on just a second, what happened? And they're running upstairs and they don't want to talk about it. And you ask their siblings, what happened to little Johnny? What happened to little Susie? And they go, something must have happened at school. No kidding. You mean they didn't have a good day? Or maybe something happened on the bus, okay? You had a bus, like, bus driver like I had when I was growing up. You could get in a knockdown, drag out, bloodletting fight in the back of the bus. And she would sit there and look at you from the big mirror you know that they had and she would say okay boys that's enough and she just keep driving okay boys that's enough you know and I mean there's bloodshed right didn't matter to her okay but your kids come in and there's some explosion and whether it's from school or whether it's from you know whatever it might be what do they need they need your example and they need you to calm things down, okay? Because children's worlds sometimes come to an end real quickly, don't they? And kind of often, okay? It's, I'm not going back to school. I'm never going to, yeah, I'm never going to, might as well just die. Can I be homeschooled? And so forth and so on. It's like, okay, um, what's the problem? Let's just calm down. Let's just love on them encourage them and listen after a rough day. That's what they need. They need you to be their nurse. I know when my wife drives home, sometimes I'll get a phone call, very often get a phone call. Um, and when she gets home, there's often, I'll say, so how was work? You know, I would have already known because she sent me a text message crazy here, horrible day, you know, whatever it is. Everybody is in the emergency room today, you know? Okay, why is that? It's 75 and sunny out. It's because it's 75 and sunny and we got nothing better to do. Hey, let's go to the emergency room. Well, for what? Well, I got a hangnail or whatever it is. Some of it's legitimate, obviously, uh, but 
she, you know, she comes home and I said, well, how was it going? She says, uh, whatever. Or maybe it was a good day. Okay. I could say, look, I don't really care. Suck it up, buttercup. You know, I don't know. Maybe she said, so how was your day? My day was great. Most of my days are great because I don't have a real job, right? I don't have to go to the office. And I don't have to deal. I don't have to deal with you folks and, you know, all this other stuff and crazy people and, and different things. And my day was swell. Well, some days your day's not swell. So what do they need? Maybe it is that they're, they're agonizing over something. Okay. As children get older, they start thinking about relationships. They start thinking about what am I going to do after I get out of school? Um, am I going to go to college? And if so, where? And if so, for what? Am I going to go to the military? If so, which branch? And if so, what kind of training am I going to get? What do I want to be? And that kind of thing. And sometimes they struggle over these things. And you, let me ask this question. Are you perceptive enough as a parent or a grandparent to look at your children and know that there, something is bothering them? Can you do that? And I dare say that we could probably all go, uh-huh. Because we know something's bothering them, man, because, you know, there's an explosion every time they show up. We know, what's wrong with you? Nothing. I'm fine. Oh, you're lying through your teeth. Right? And what do they need? They need you to say, hey, look, what's going on? Talk to me. I want to help you. I know I see that it hurts. What is it? What can I do for you? And that kind of thing. And they, they need you to be their nurse. Now, you got to understand this. They don't, want, um, they don't want a wet nurse, okay? They don't want some, and they don't need, although you might do this as a mom, you might, you might walk behind them and pick, out, pick up after them. Trust me, they don't need that. They need to learn to be responsible, pick your stuff up, clean your stuff, whatever it is, clean your room. And that doesn't mean shove everything that's on the floor underneath the bed or in the closet, right? They need to learn how to do that, to be responsible. But you, as their example, need to be the one that calms, encourages, loves, and listens. You have to do that. That's a good example. That's what they need. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy chapter six. Look at verse. Well, let's start reading. I'm going to start at verse one because we got to put it all together. Okay. Deuteronomy six, one says, now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in a the land whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord or reverence the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes, commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son. How many generations is that? Thou, thy sons, and thy son's sons. How many generations is that? Three. Okay. All the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, O Israel, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Now, he's already just said, make sure, basically, make sure you do what God says three times now, okay? How many times do we got to be told? Probably a whole lot more than that, right? Because you read through Scripture, and you find out that constantly God is trying to remind us to do some things. That it might be maybe well with thee, verse 3, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy father hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might, 
And these words which I command me to command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. What is he getting at? Well, one of the things that your family needs that God is reminding the children of Israel through Moses here in Deuteronomy is that your family needs you to instill the word of God into their lives. And the only way you can do that is if you are living what God says. You are a, a living illustration and commercial for what it means to follow the Lord. You have to be that. They need that. And I was thinking about this as, as far as an illustration is concerned. My wife used to, she used to, she doesn't anymore because it's not on our diet even though I'm not on the Weight Watchers diet unless she cooks for us. So um, she used to make bread. One of the ladies up in Monroe County, she could make yeast rolls better than anybody. It didn't matter if, if it was Texas Roadhouse. It didn't matter if it was, you know, Bob Evans or Cracker Barrel, you name somebody that puts out yeast rolls and the ones that she made were better. I guarantee it. I have probably 15 pounds on me that verify that fact. I remember she got this recipe and she said, I'm going to make some yeast rolls. And I was going great. She made these yeast rolls, and I remember Jonathan was small. We didn't have David at that time. And um, my wife pulled this pan out of the oven. Of course, the whole, whole house, you could smell it from outside, right? It's like, <sighs> only reason you could smell it from outside was because the house that we lived in, in Louisville, was, bo was born, was built in 1912. And it, you know, wasn't real insulated in certain parts and there were some gaps here and there and stuff like that. So everything that was inside got out and everything that was outside got in. You could tell when skunks just walked by the house, you know, it's kind of like, whoo, okay. But she's got this pan and she's sitting there and she takes the butter and she kind of wipes it off, you know, the, the tops of them and everything. And, 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 and we're sitting there and, and, and between the three of us, we ate the entire 13 rolls. Oh, they were good. Oh. It was like. <laughs> <laughs> then we went, oh, wow, that was a mistake. But let's make some more. So we went ahead and she made some. And it's kind of like, no, nah, he can't touch. Stay away. No. OK. She found out real quickly that dough sometimes gets sticky. If you've ever made bread, you know how that works out, right? And you'll sit there and you're trying to, and, and you're following the recipe and everything. And you, and you pull this thing out after it's set and risen and, you know, been pumped down and risen again and all this other stuff. And you throw it out there on the counter to make rolls out of it. And you go to, and you, and you go, yeah, you know, it's like, like Play-Doh or something. And you, you and, and what do you need? You need a little flour. Put, sprinkle a little flour down, put it on there, and guess what happens? It doesn't stick anymore. It's easy to work with, okay? Bread dough starts out sticky. We all know that. But flour solves the problem, okay? Now, let's, and I don't mean to spiritualize flour and different things, but as your family needs you to be their example, their nurse, and instill God's word in them, what happens? Sometimes you personally get a little sticky. You get a little prickly. You get kind of like a porcupine. You know what I'm saying? And you're backing into life, right? And everybody comes by you, you're turning around and you're on defense and you're trying to, you know, and that kind of thing. Okay, wait a minute. What do they need? They don't need that. Okay. They need you 
to instill God's word. And the only way that you can do that is to apply the flower, if you will, of God's word into your life personally. I mentioned to you before that children pick up stuff. And I'm not talking about their clothes and the trash and that kind of thing. You should teach them how to do that. You dropped it, pick it up, right? Um, since I don't bend very well anymore, I'll see something and maybe it's something I dropped on the floor. And especially if the boys are home, David in particular, I go, hey, David, how about pick that up for me? It's like, Dad, you just dropped it. So, yeah, but yeah, right? You, 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 you play the old age card, right? If he goes, pick it up yourself. You go, wait a minute, young man. I am the head of this household and children are supposed to obey their parents and honor them. So pick it up, right? You can't do that. But sometimes what, what you need to do is, okay, take your own advice. Get into the word of God, let it get into you and let it come out so your family sees it because they pick up more than you realize. Now, my question to you is this. Do they see that in your life? You might say, well, I don't have any kids in my home, in my home, my house and home and to combine it is home. Okay, I just made up a new word. Um, but it, they're, they're, not, they're out. Okay? But do they still see you? Do they still come and interact with you? Do they still need your example? Do they still need you to be their nurse, to, a, to, to, to calm, encourage, love, and listen to them periodically? Even as adults? I know I was talking to Jonathan just the other day and uh, it was just a, a really good conversation my son and I, I, I hesitate to put this on tape because he might look at it but what I am seeing from my oldest son I am watching him become and it blesses my heart more than I can say I am watching him become a southern gentleman because he just recently joined a land lease to go hunt. He's interested in turkey hunting now. I not, I don't think I've ever been turkey hunting, but he's talking about getting involved with this group and different things and, and, and maybe taking Madison sometime to go hunt and all this other stuff. And, and he's already getting into harvesting game, preparing the game, fixing the game and eating the game likes that kind of stuff and he's you know working in his in his garage we're doing some woodworking and different things like that and, and he's caring for his wife and and being a testimony at church and being involved with a youth group and and all of these kind of things and guess where he lives he lives in south carolina which blesses my heart he was born down there i keep reminding him I'd say, but Jonathan, when he would root for the Ohio State Buckeyes, I would say, but Jonathan, you are a, you are a Gamecock. He's going, what? No, I'm not. I said, hey, wait a minute. I was there when you were born, and I know where you were born. It says on your birth certificate, buddy, okay? But I'm watching that. I'm watching David, you know, get more involved in his church and, and, and work with you know, his co-workers and the Department of Social Services and all that. And you watch it as you watch him mature, that blesses my heart. And I'm hoping that what I'm seeing is some of what I taught him. I hope that anything bad I see in my boys, they got from their mother and not me. <laughs> But that's, yeah, okay. Y'all, you got your, I felt the eye rolls, okay? Even on camera, it's kind of like the camera just moved and it's like, right, okay, sure. But what are, you're, you're gonna see this come out in your, in your family. Regardless of whether you have them in the home, regardless of whether they're children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, adults or, 
or not, it doesn't really matter. But they need you to be an example, to be their gentler, to instill the word of God in their lives as you are doing it in your own. And I'm not going to take you to 3 John 4, but I want to read a verse because this is such a blessing. And I hope we will all be eventually able to say this. John 3 and verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children... Now, John, the, the, the apostle, okay, who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the epistles, and Revelation as well, he was the beloved disciple, the, the disciple that Jesus loved, okay? He's not just... He, he, he may not even be talking about his actual physical offspring, but he is talking about spiritual children. And he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, my question to you is this, are they doing so because of your influence or in spite of it? Hopefully it is the former and not the latter. Someone you know needs to see your godly example and only God's word in your life will prevent you from being sticky and presenting the wrong kind of testimony and example to your family. What does your family really need? They need you to live for the Lord, follow his commandments, and and be the kind of example of that that you ought to be. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to examine what kind of example we are being in our, and to our family. Help us to examine our words, our thoughts, our actions. Do they, do, does our family simply overlook something because they've gotten used to it? That's just the way mom and dad, grandma and grandpa are. We know it's not a right example, but we're not willing to do anything to change it. Is that what they see? Or do they see the kind of example that we would be, be proud to see in them? Impress upon our hearts, Lord, which is the case.